All right, starting on chapter 10, we are looking at radical reactions. In this chapter, we're going to learn a new reaction or two, and we're going to revisit an old one. But we are going to be focused on radical mechanisms. So getting into this, it's important to think about the arrows. We have mostly been looking at, so for instance, like when our SN1 and E1 reactions, we have been looking at the bond between, let's say we're looking at carbon and a halogen. We've been looking at a heterolytic cleavage, right? Where that takes both electrons in a bond and leaves us with a cation and an anion. This is heterolytic. And we see this type of bond breaking and bond formation a lot in organic. But in this chapter, we're gonna be focused on radicals. So we're going to be looking at the homolytic cleavages where we have two atoms that are held together by a, a covalent bond. And instead of the bond breaking and both electrons going in one direction, the electrons are going to split up. Now notice two different arrow types here, right? If both electrons are moving in one direction, we get a double-headed arrow. If one electron is moving or the electrons are moving in different directions, we get a single-headed arrow, right? That arrow communicates a lot to us about where the electrons are going and also how many electrons are moving. This produces radicals, right? A radical doesn't have a charge, but it has an unpaired electron. Now, oh, sorry. There may be more lone pairs, but oftentimes you will see just the radical electron shown because that's often what we're focused on. So for instance, in one of the reactions, you're going to see a halogen being broken up into radicals, and you will notice that it will be shown like this. Now, absolutely, there are lone pairs that are present. I'm gonna show them here in red. But when we are focused on the radicals, sometimes the lone pairs are left off, just because that's not what we're focused on. It's not wrong to draw them, you absolutely can. Um, but I don't want you to think that they're not there. It's just that if we're focused on that radical, sometimes that's all we show. The radical has got a little bit of a different, it, it behaves differently than the cations and anions we've seen, um, but kind of somewhere in the middle. The cation, if you recall, is flat. So that's why with SN1 and E1 reactions, or SN1 reactions, you got racemization because a nucleophile could attack from either side. A carbanion maintains its trigonal, or no, I'm sorry, its um, tetrahedral electron geometry. And a radical is kind of somewhere in the middle. It's not perfectly flat, but it's not as um, tetrahedral in geometry as, as, uh, as the anion. And so it's, it's kind of like in the middle. The stability, it's important that you recognize this because it will help you predict products. It, the stability is the same trend as the carbocation, right? The more R groups you have, the more stable it's going to be. Um, resonance can also be a stabilizing factor, right? So it's the exact same stability trend as carbocations. This is definitely something you need to know. Sorry, I didn't meant to underline that, not cross it out. All right, so make sure that you are committing that to your memory. Um, just another slide telling you the same thing, but showing you um, actual bond energies. Now, resonance is still something that you might um, have to think about here, right? Because it can stabilize a radical. Anytime you can spread out sort of the pain of a charge or a radical, the better. And so if you have an allylic radical, you can 
Because remember, all that you're doing when you're going from one resonance structure to another is moving electrons. As long as all of the atoms are still bonded in the same order, then it is a valid Lewis structure. It's just you'll notice that the arrows getting from one uh, resonance structure to the other are reflecting that it's just a single electron that's moving at a time, right? And so we can see that an allylic radical is stabilized by resonance, right? Both carbons on the, on the ends are sort of holding that radical instability. The more resonance structures you can draw, the more stable that radical will be. Radicals are very reactive, so anything that can stabilize them, right, will will make them less reactive. That will be a little that will be important when we talk about things like radical inhibitors a little bit later. And this just all um, just reviewing that stability. Um, vinyl radicals are especially unstable. So just like we never made a carbocation directly on a double bond, you're not going to see a radical directly on a double bond um, unless we are looking at... Oh, no, we didn't see that in our, in our last mechanism either. Um, it's just very unlikely. It's much more likely to be uh, on an sp3 carbon. Allylic is going to be the most stable because of resonance. A primary... Uh, carbon radical, you know, it's less stable because it's not resonant stabilized, but it's going to be much more stable than a vanillic one, one directly on a double bond. Now, there are patterns um, in, in our radical mechanisms. I'm going to go through them quickly because we are going to take a look at them more specifically when we get into an actual reaction. So we're just going to go through these six rather quickly, right? There is going to be homolytic cleavage, like we've already talked about, where a bond breaks spontaneously. Now I say spontaneously because nothing, uh, there's no other arrows coming in and pushing this, but it would be initiated. There would be some reason it fell apart. Most of the reactions we're going to, or I'm sorry, the first reactions we're going to look at are going to be initiated by light um, but we will also see some chemical initiations like with peroxides a little bit later. Um, there will be the reaction between a radical and a pi bond. And you'll notice that you form a new sigma bond, but you wind up with a radical on the carbon. So a lot of our reactions that we're going to be looking at are known as propagation. And so these three fall in that category where we have a radical it reacts with a double or single bond, and at the end of the day, we are at the end of that step, we are left with another radical. So it's something that will still keep reacting. Um, a hydrogen abstraction. So it's not an acid-base step because we're not taking a proton. We're taking a hydrogen, right? That means it's got an electron with it. Um, that can be done. Uh, we're going to see that done with halogens. It can be done with other things as well. Um, we're going to see a halogen abstraction. Um, the same idea as the hydrogen, except we're looking at a halogen. There are eliminations that can occur. We're going to see that. Um, no, we're not actually going to use this one in this chapter. Um, and then there's a coupling reaction. This is a terminating step where your radicals come together and then there are no radicals at the end. So this can be done with halogens. This can be done with any kind of radical. So if that was quick, don't worry. We're going to go through specific steps a little bit more slowly. All right, so it's just summarizing that right there. What we're going to be interested in is with our radical mechanisms especially the two main ones that we're going to cover in this chapter, there are three steps. There is initiation. Now, it doesn't mean that there's only three steps. There's three groupings of steps. An initiation is where we're going to form the radical. Now, this may be one or two steps. It just depends on what the initiation looks like. Number two, propagation. Propagation. Right? That's where we start with a radical 
and we have a radical at the end of the step. There can be multiple propagation steps in a mechanism. And finally, termination. This is when the reaction, this is a step that ends the reaction. It's where you have two radicals, it's a coupling reaction, and they react and they form no radical. All right, so that's the fir first time you're seeing products that are less reactive and the reaction can actually end. So we are gonna be grouping. This chapter is a little bit different in how we look at mechanisms instead of just starting at the beginning and moving forward until we get to the product, we are going to sort of look at these steps individually and see whether they fit into one, two, or three category. Um, it's showing you, so the six steps that they looked at, it's showing you how they fit into initiation, propagation, and termination. Now, what we're gonna be interested in first is the free, radical halogenation mechanism. This is gonna be us taking an alkane, a halogen, and you're gonna notice that most of the time, and I'm just gonna go ahead and write it in here, it's actually gonna be Br2. We are gonna start by looking at chlorine. The mechanism's exactly the same, but we will discuss why Br2 is ideal so when I do the mechanism on the right side of your screen, I'm going to be using bromine because I want you to get used to seeing that. And you are going to make an alkyl bromide. All right, so we are going to be taking some sort of CH bond, and at the end, we are going to replace it with bromine. All right, so... We're gonna start off with the free radical halogenation of methane, because that is the simplest possible starting material. All right, CH3, we're going to, I'm gonna use bromine, you're gonna have the chlorine over here, and something very important, H nu. This is light, right? This is letting us know that there is some wavelength of light that is being used to get this reaction going and we are gonna be making bromomethane. Now, the first step, the initiation, it is a homolytic cleavage. Methane is not involved in step one. Step one is just your halogen. It is critical that you put the light in this step because this does not happen in the dark. Right, this has to be initiated with, um, with light. With the light in place, now you can have that homolytic cleavage. It doesn't matter if I put the arrows on top or bottom or one on top, one on bottom, as long as I am showing that bond cleaving and giving us two bromine radicals. And again, you can put in the lone pairs or not. I would say if you're doing a homework problem, Make sure that you read through. A lot of times, client or I'm sorry, sapling will ask you for those non-bonding electrons. For me, I I'm concerned with that radical electron. This is step one, right? This is the beginning of the mechanism. Once this has been initiated, this reaction can go on um, on its own. It doesn't require that you initiate very many molecules of your halogen. And this is why. There are going to be two propagation steps here. All right, and I will let you know how many steps I'm looking for by putting something in parentheses like so. That bromine radical is going to interact with that CH bond. In this case, it's methane, so there are four CH bonds you are going to be doing that hydrogen abstraction. You're gonna be making HBr. So you do make some HBr byproduct, but you also make a... That carbon radical is going to be very reactive, right? So that's gonna be the part, the, the product that, or I'm sorry, intermediate that moves on. So the second step, we're going to take, um, I'm going to just flip it around just so that the arrows are a little less messy looking. 
This is actually going to react with another Br2 molecule. It is not necessary that all of the bromine breaks apart because this carbon radical will now do a halogen extraction. It will make that final product, right? And we will make our halogenated alkane, right? Or our alkyl halide. But it will also make a bromine radical. So this is a chain reaction. Once you have one bromine radical and it gets this reaction started, bromine is formed in the propagation step, right? So once you've initiated a little bit, this reaction can keep itself going. From there, when does this reaction end? Well, any time two radicals come together, right, you get a termination step. How many termination steps are possible depends on what kinds of radicals were formed. So if we go back and we look, the types of radicals that were formed were the bromine radical and the carbon radical, and that's it. So any termination step is going to be when some combination of those radicals run into one another. So if the bromine radical here runs into the carbon radical, well, then we make product, right? The bromomethane. There's no reason I've written it backwards from the one above. It's the same molecule. Right? That would be considered a termination step because we did not produce any more bromine radicals to keep the reaction going. If bromine runs into another bromine radical, right, and I sh you should put the arrows in, right, this is just a coupling reaction, then you make a little bit more Br2, and that can go back into the reaction. The one that's a little bit different here, and I'm going to blow this up so I can draw it, is you might also make a very, very small amount of ethane because if your two carbon radicals come together, then you will make a new carbon-carbon bond. Now, this is going to be a very minor byproduct because the carbon radicals will react very quickly, and so you'll never have a very high concentration of them. So the statistics of them actually running into each other is pretty low. Uh, but if they ran into each other, that would be a termination step. Now, you don't see any hydrogen radicals down here because we didn't make any in the propagation or initiation steps. The only terminations that can occur are going to occur between radicals that were made. So I may ask you to just show one termination step. I may ask you to show two or three in this instance, but it's just a combination of radicals that are made during that uh, initiation and propagation. The overall sum of your propagation steps gives you the overall reaction, right? Um, the initiation and the termination steps um, are kind of secondary in that regard. Uh, the propagation is that chain reaction. Once it gets going, right, that reaction can sustain itself without more initiating. Um, something that's tough and why we show why bromination can be more powerful is polychlorination is very difficult to prevent. Um, once you add one chlorine, it's often going to just, it will keep reacting. Um, it's also less selective, which we're also going to see. Uh, now, radical initiators, before we get into anything else here, there are several ways to initiate. When we look at this reaction, I will consistently use light. Heat may also be part of it. There are also chemical initiators. You guys used AIBN in lab or in your virtual lab. Um, peroxides is another chemical initiator. We are going to see that in a subsequent video. Um, an acyl peroxide's an, an initiator. That's not one that we're gonna take a look at, but there are several different ways to initiate. There are also ways to inhibit, right? If um, 
we want to stop radicals from reacting, there are things like inhibitors. Now, that's maybe not going to be something that is uh, really important to us in a lab where we are trying to do a radical reaction. Um, but if you are attempting to kind of contain a radical, or which is especially important um, in different applications, there are things that can react with a radical to kind of neutralize them. This could be important in, say, the aging process. Two, uh, I'm going to give you two examples here. Oxygen O2 is actually a di-radical and can react with other radicals. It's why you're so interested when you're thinking about nutrition and like skincare and anti-aging, why you so often hear the word antioxidant. An antioxidant is something that will react with that oxygen di-radical because radicals can create havoc. They're so reactive that they can break bonds and react with things that you don't want them to. So for instance, what happens when you cut open an avocado? As soon as that oxygen starts um, reacting with the surface of that avocado, it starts quote unquote aging, right? It starts turning brown. How can you prevent that? Well, if you've ever made guacamole, you know you could just squeeze a lime on it. Well, why does that work? Limes and other citrus ha are full of vitamin C and vitamin C is an antioxidant. Vitamin C can work to neutralize something like this oxygen radical, right? It's also why it's so important in, in skincare, right? You want antioxidants and like vitamin C is a, another, is in one that you often see in skincare products nowadays because it will fight signs of aging due to radical reactions from oxygen, from o, an O2 radical. Um, this is not vitamin C, but this is a different inhibitor, hydroquinone. It will react with radicals, either with the oxygen radical or with, um, with, with carbon radicals that are formed. And it will form its own stabilized radical. But why this is an even better inhibitor is this reaction can happen on both sides and it can rearrange into not a radical into a really stable benzoquinone molecule. You are not required.